Hi, I'm Louis. Today we'll have a look at how an implementation of a differential line growth algorithm in Blender in geometry nodes might look like and how we can spice it up using some curvature growth. The biggest hurdle that we are facing here is implementing a point relaxation function as there is no way to sample multiple near points at the moment. But we'll get back to that later. First, we'll start with some theory. As the name suggests, we want a line to grow. This line should consist of evenly spaced segments. Now every point on this curve looks inside a radius that is slightly higher than the segment length and then tries to move away from the points that it finds inside this radius. This is the point relaxation function. After this, we resample the curve so we have evenly spaced segments like we had at the start. And by applying these two steps over and over again, we get our typical line growth patterns. Now let's jump into Blender. I'm using version 4.0 here, but you can use any version that has the simulation nodes implemented, so 3.6 and above. Let's get started by adding a new geometry node system and adding a curve line. You can connect it to the output by holding Alt and Shift and clicking the curve line node. At the moment this is pointing towards the Z direction, but we want this flush with the floor. So let's set the start and end positions of the curve to X-1 and X1 and the Z position to 0. Right now this curve only consists of two points. And as mentioned before, we want a segmented curve. So let's get in here a resample curve. And let's set the mode to length. And I like to go with the value of 0 0.05. Now let's get a simulation zone in here and connect it. In here we need two nodes, one set position. This will take care of our point relaxation function and a resample curve. We can just copy the one from the beginning. Now we need a way to sample near points and at the moment you can only sample the nearest point with the index of nearest node, which is a really limiting factor at the moment. But for now, this will have to do. We can now sample the position of this nearest point by using a evaluate at index node, setting the type to vector and connecting the index of the nearest point and a position node. Now by subtracting this position from our current position, we get the vector that is moving our point away from its nearest point. By the way, instead of adding a vector math node, you can drag the output of any node and search for math functions there directly. Now we measure the length of this vector so we can determine how far we should move our point. By subtracting the length from the radius we set, we get the distance our point needs to move to be on the edge of the radius. This radius should be slightly higher than our resampling length, in this case 0.06. Now we can normalize our vector and scale it by our adjusted length. Let's turn on the clamp for our subtract node so we can handle some fringe cases where the nearest point is further away than our radius. After that, add another scale and plug it into the offset of the set position. Now the trick to this point relaxation function is a repeat zone, as this gives the points the opportunity to catch more than one near point and thereby approximating the ability to sample a neighborhood of points. For now let's set the iterations to 10. At the moment this will only push our points along the line because there is no variation in the point positions. So let's add a little noise before the simulation zone, add a set position node, add a noise texture and plug the color into the offset. In this case let's make sure that our z component is 0, so add a multiply node and multiply by 110. And at the moment this is way too strong, so we can adjust this to 0.01. Our point relax is too strong as well at the moment because we are repeating the step 10 times. So let's adjust this to 0.15 and let's try this. And as you can see we are getting some growth patterns here. Now we can smooth this out a little bit by using a fillet curve. Set this to poly, turn on the limit radius and set the radius to something like 0.03, so something very small. And this moves out the simulation quite a bit. To make the setup a bit more concise, we can group this point relaxation into a new node group. For this, select the nodes that you want to group and press Ctrl G. Let's set up all the inputs that we want to have exposed, so the iterations, the radius and the scale. Now let's rename this, so the value is the radius and iterations and scale is fine like that. Also let's clean this up a bit. 
We can copy the group input node and connect the values here. And then press Ctrl H. This will hide all unconnected sockets. We can now go back to our previous layer by pressing Tab on the keyboard. Now, this is the basic setup done, and it's in general quite flexible. And what I like to do now is add a little curvature growth or a little noise and to play around with the setup. But first, let's make our line growth a bit more visible. Add a Boolean node, click the checkbox so it returns a value of 1, and connect it to the viewer node by holding Ctrl and Shift and clicking the node you want to view. Now head up to the viewport shading, enable viewport for the background, and set it to something darker. As I said, I like to combine this setup with some curvature growth. This means that we measure the angle of each point on the curve and detect each point based on its measured angle in some way. Unfortunately, Blender doesn't have an internal node for measuring the curve angle, but we can easily build our own. So to calculate this angle we need two vectors, the one pointing from the previous point on the curve to our point and then from our point to the next point on the curve. Fortunately, we can easily sample these points by using a offset point in curve node. By setting the offset to minus 1 we get the previous point on the curve and let's copy this and by setting the offset to 1 we get the next point on the curve. Now to calculate these vectors we want to sample the position so let's get a position node in here. Now we can again sample at those point indices with a evaluate at index node. Plug the point index output into the index input and set the data type to vector. Copy this again and plug the second node in here and now let's connect the positions and add a vector math node. Set it to subtract and now we want the vector from the position of the previous point to our point. So subtract from our current position the position of the previous point and now copy this node. Now we want to subtract our position from the next point's position. Now normalize both these vectors. Now add another vector math node and set it to dot product and let's connect those both. And by calculating the r cosine of this dot product we get the angle. By connecting this to the viewer node and opening the spreadsheet we can check if these values are correct. The measured angles here are in radians so they range from 0 to pi. At the moment all these values are positive but I like to have the option to check if an angle is convex or concave. And we can do this by checking the cross product of these normalized vectors and then checking if the z component of this cross product is negative or positive. By adding a normalized node we scale this to 1 or minus 1 and now we can just multiply our r cosine here by the z component and we get our signed angle. Just to show you real quick. The z component here is either 1 or minus 1 and this tells us if the angle is convex or concave. Now let's clean this up a bit. We can collapse those nodes and stack them underneath to make it a bit more compact. Now let's also group this. I like to go with the style of the edge angle node here. So let's connect the arc cosine. This is our unsigned angle. And then our multiplied angle. This is the signed angle. And of course, name our node group here. Let's name it curve angle. And our point relaxation up here as well. Let's name it point relax. Now to add vector our points, we need a vector. And for that, we can use the normal node to push the points along the curve normal. Now if we scale our normal by our curve angle, we only get growth in the areas where curvature is highest. Now let's add another scale node behind this, so we have control over how strong this effect will be. Now plug this into the offset of our set position node and set the value to something like 0.02. We have to be a bit careful with these values because we can easily break our simulation. As you can see we are already getting overlaps here. In this case we can easily fix this by adding a blur node behind our curve angle here to smooth this out a bit. Set the blur to something like 9 iterations. And now let's see how this plays out. And already, this looks a lot better. I'm gonna fast forward the simulation here a bit. Now we can also try the unsigned angle and see what this does. 
and I like those spiraling patterns. But we can get a lot more control in here. For example, by dropping in a map range node and plugging it between the curve angle and the blur attribute node. I like to go with the signed angle here, but this is the part where you can just play around with all the sliders and numbers and see what interesting patterns you can create. Also, we can make our preview here a lot more interesting. Just copy the curve angle, drop a blur attribute after this, set the iteration count to something like 5, and then drop a color ramp after this. Now let's choose some interesting colors here and see how this looks by plugging it into the viewer node. We can also drop the background color completely down so we can see this better. And as I said, you can just now play around with all these values a bit. And now just to show you how the intro animation was made, I plug the blur attribute node in front of the map range, set the iterations to 20. For the map range you can just copy these values here, the scale at 0.02 and I used the unsigned angle for this. I also changed some values up here. I set the iterations to 5 and the scale to 0.25. I also changed the fillet radius to 0.007 and the count to 2. And this gives off this kind of inward blooming effect that I really like. Now let's get to actually rendering this. First we can smooth this out a bit by using another fillet curve, setting it to poly, limit the radius and adjusting the count. But by using the fillet curve node like this, we will get overlapping points, but this is easily fixed by adding another resample node after this, setting the length to something like 0.02 in this case, and it should be fine. Now let's set up the rest. We want to apply material, so let's get a set material node in here and also a set curve radius node. I'll set the radius to 0.002 as this works well for the values that I've used. Now the usual way how you could render this in Blender is using a curve to mesh node as Blender doesn't support edge rendering. By plugging a curve circle into our profile curve here, we give our line some actual geometry that Blender can render. As I said, this is the usual way how you would do this, but there is a more efficient way, because we can actually exploit the hair rendering system of Blender. Let's delete our curve to mesh node here, and instead add an empty hair object to our scene here. You can find this under the curve tab in the add menu, and this automatically gets parented to the object that was selected before. This hair object also uses the geometry node system. By the way, if you ever get lost in the geometry node system, you can just press A and then press the dot on the numpad to recenter. Okay, so for this to work, you have to drag your curve object into the geometry node system here and connect it to the output. Now we can hide our original curve and you'll see that our hair object is in here, but it's only drawn with a very low amount of points. This actually isn't a problem because this is only how it looks in the viewport. As soon as we switch to rendered view and turn off the scene world, you can see that it's rendering fine. Not that this only works in cycles, not in Eevee, but this shouldn't be a problem because this is rendering super efficiently, because there's no actual faces that have to be rendered. Now let's set up the rest of the material. We can store our angle attribute onto our points here, so we can use it in the material in a moment. Drop in a store named attribute here. Let's also blur our angle here again, because we can do that in the shader nodes. Let's name this attribute angle and open the shader editor. Here we can add a attribute node and type in our attribute name, so angle, and connect this to our output. I will just copy the color ramp and the map range node from down here, because I like the color scheme that I had going. Now let's connect all those and plug them into an emission shader. We can now turn on the scene world again because we don't need the lighting anymore. And with this we are done. All that's left now is setting up your camera and rendering this. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and found this useful. So thanks for watching 
and see you in the next one.